Welcome to the How Food and Fiber Companies Can Invest in Soil Health session. My name is Rex Dufour, and I'll be your moderator today. I manage NCAT's office in Davis, California. Um, I'd request that you put your questions into any questions you have into the Zoom chat, and we'll have about 10 minutes uh, at the end of the session for Q&A, uh, where I'll try to get to all your questions. If we don't get to all your questions, we'll respond via email. And then um, also for uh, certified crop advisors, crop consultants, uh, there'll be a QR code uh, available at the end of the session that you can kind of uh, use to certify your credit. Uh, we've got a very interesting session today, so I'd like to introduce both of our speakers now. Our first speaker will be Rebecca Burgess. Uh, she's got a master's in education and is the executive director of Fibershed and the chair of the board for the Carbon Cycle Institute. She has over two decades of experience writing and implementing a hands-on curriculum that focuses on the intersection of restoration ecology and fiber systems. She has taught at Westminster College, Harvard University, and has created workshops for a range of NGOs and uh, corporations. She is also author of the best-selling book, Harvesting Color, a bioregional look into the natural dye traditions of North America and uh, fiber shed. Growing, uh, the other book is, uh, Fibershed Growing, a movement of farmers, fashion activists, and makers for a new textile economy, which was released in 2019. She has facilitated an extensive network of farmers and artisans within our region's Northern California Fibershed to pilot the regenerative fiber systems model at the community scale. And I've had the privilege and honor of working with her on uh, one or two of these. Uh, our second speaker will be Dr. Randy Brown, who is the Director of Agronomic Strategy for Winfield United, which is a Land O'Lakes company. He received his BS and MS in, agron in agronomy from University of Nebraska and his PhD from Kansas State. After graduation, Randy was on the faculty of Kansas State as crops and soil specialist, teaching and doing research in soil fertility and precision ag, he has been working with the Winfield United Agronomy team going on 23 years uh, since last century, I guess. And he has lifelong passion for agriculture, especially working in the area of interface between science and agronomic practice. Randy is currently focused on agronomic sustainability. Randy, his wife, Beth, and his two sons, Justin and Cody, are active in production agriculture as owners of the Lazy E.T. Ranch in the Sand Hills of Nebraska. So, Rebecca, I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Rex. It's really nice to be here with you and Randall. It's an honor. So I appreciate the, the forum. I'm going to, um, I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, so um, Rex in my bio described that we work at a regional level, and that's technically what a fiber shed is. It's analogous to a watershed or a food shed. The idea that there's a strategic geography that defines a textile resource base is actually a very ancient idea, <laughs> but in this um, current context of global trade and kind of opaque supply chains, we tend to forget that clothing is an agricultural product and that at one point it was um, plant and animal fibers and a diverse cropping system would have produced and yielded um, our first form of shelter, which is our clothing. Um, so the work that I do as an, uh, both as a, you know, a network hub leader at this point, we work with 111 farms and ranches um, in our 51 county region of North Central California. A lot of the effect of what this graph shows is, is showing up. Um, Rex and I were just talking about the fact that we've got, um, you know, one of the driest years in 90 years. Um, and the fact that the CO2E concentrations are 
really drastically changing California's weather patterns and um, it's showing up and farmers are on the front line of this and so in our work to redevelop fiber sheds, you know, we have to interface with this reality. We have to be both adapting and mitigating. And agriculture is such a complex and dynamic biological system <laughs> that we're ultimately working with. It has the ability to both adapt, but also to mitigate. Um, and so here you see that this is um, IPCC, you know, this idea that, you know, both our smokestacks and tailpipes functionally have to become neutral. We have to ne neutralize the transportation and the manufacturing and the distribution aspects of our industrial economy while simultaneously developing sinks, sinks for carbon. And those are in natural and working landscapes. Um, and that both of these efforts have to occur simultaneously for us to stabilize our climate. So how does this you know, work with markets? Um, markets are seeing this destabilization. Markets are experiencing, due to climate, they're experiencing what they, you know, this year, um, I just got the cotton data for California, looks like between 30 and 14% reductions in cotton acreage, which is already acreage that had been reduced significantly from years prior. Um, this means that textile um, industry leaders are looking for more cotton and can't find it <laughs> because acreage is being reduced. This is just one example of many in the food, fiber, fuel, and flora sectors where um, we're seeing changes in what we can grow and where we can grow it, and this is destabilizing supply chains. So how do we kind of reverse this narrative um, uh, and also practically <laughs> reverse the effects of this situation? Um, so what Fibershed has done in collaboration with the Carbon Cycle Institute, um, with partners um, like NCAT, the UC Extension Service, the Natural Resource um, Conservation Service, is to, to look at the ways in which we have historically been looking at soil conservation. And again, this is the work of um, largely Dr. Jeff Creek at the Carbon Cycle Institute, to look at the conservation farm planning model and to, to think about that model that came out of the Dust Bowl and to apply that those methods of protecting soil and conserving it from erosion and to actually think about how do we regenerate those soils to build soil organic carbon, not just mitigate loss, but actually build. And as we're building carbon in our soil systems, we are simultaneously, you know, that carbon has to come from somewhere and it's coming from the atmosphere, moving through the biosphere, moving through the liquid carbon pathway, um, into our soils. So as we're building carbon, we're, we're also supporting the movement of carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil or the pedosphere. This act uh, is going on all the time due to photosynthetic carbon capture on our planet. But how do we enhance that natural pathway through working landscapes? And then how do we talk about that to the marketplace? So um, again, how do we have agriculture become a mitigating force, but also a force to, to stabilize some of the supply chain disruption? So our community has been looking at, we started in wool systems, wool and lamb markets. Um, lamb really is the feature, wool is a byproduct. And working with this idea of the conservation farm plan kind of transformed into what we call a carbon farm plan these carbon farm plans have been written by resource conservation districts and other technical service providers for our producers. I mentioned we work with about 111 producers on 190,000 acres of land. 170,000 acres of land it now has a plan associated with it. Um, and those plans, we start the program with soil sampling. Um, we think about what is the best first practice we can implement, and we use the suite of practices that the NRCS has traditionally used to conserve and protect soil from erosion. We're thinking about those same practices again in this light of building soil. <clears throat> so we think of, you know, what's, what's available funding-wise through a QIP or maybe through our state's Healthy Soils program. Can we aggregate public dollars and help implement a practice? Or is this affordable for the producer to do on their own? We, step three, we initiate this practice with the producer and we give them this transitional verification. So Fibershed runs a back-end database that's very extensive. It has lists of practices, dates when things were implemented. It, we model all of the GHGs associated with the implementation. We can create 
um, predictions over what's going to happen in five years, 20 years, um, everything that Comet allows you to do um, as, a, as a computer modeling tool to make predictive analysis around greenhouse gas reductions. We use that tool to share those <clears throat> bits and details with the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> so this is how the, the producers have become part of our climate beneficial wool program. So when I started this program, producers were either selling into distribution hubs that were sending wool to China or Turkey or other locations where there's value added manufacturing. And they were getting paid on commodity pricing that might have looked like 80 cents a pound, a dollar a pound, um, maybe a dollar fifty a pound. So um, we stabilized the price. We said, if you producers can initiate this, this work on your land and eventually get a plan, a full plan from a technical service provider and then start an annual implementation commitment and you sign off that you will commit to practicing this work on an annual basis, we'll stabilize the price at $2.50 a pound and we'll bring additional dollars to help you implement. So um, we, we've worked with, um, Right now we're, we're working with around $2.50 a pound, but we are trying to see that number go up. And I said, as I just said, we bring grant dollars to the table as well. And here's an example of where grant dollars are really helpful. Some of the practices that we know that Equip would pay for, here's a, the establishment of a shelter belt um, in a very high and dry part of California. And this is on a, a, a wool producing ranch. And this particular practice doesn't necessarily directly influence the ranch's bottom line positively. So how do you start to do practices that we know capture above ground carbon, increase forage for pollinators, create protection um, on the list also has um, a series of trees planted in one section. So it creates a windbreak effect. So the, um, the brand, the textile brand that we're working with on this case was the North Face and they they matched the NRCS dollars. So they're not only buying the wool at a price premium, but they're also donating corporate social responsibility dollars and matching that to NRCS dollars to see this um, shelter belt um, established. And this is a one mile uh, stretch. We also see this investment by the, br the brand community at the early stages for research. So this is Guest Jeans, um, the denim company, um, supporting research that Rex is part of um, in the San Joaquin Valley. This is just a, the beginning of looking at how do we potentially transition conventional cotton acreage using the principles of regenerate, regenerative or regenerative ag. Um, and so here you see compost, uh, not, I'm sorry, <laughs> not compost applied yet. There will be compost applied, but right now you're seeing a, um, a multi-species cover crop in a cotton system. It's a longer rotation system. It's, I believe it's cotton, tomatoes, garlic, onions, potentially wheat. It's part of a larger food rotation. But here you're seeing a winter cover. This photo was just taken um, recently. And normally the soil would be, would be bare in the winter. And so this idea of can we, you know, California is pretty short on water. Um, so what are we going to do? Are we going to, how do we adapt some of these ideas of the keeping living roots in the soil? How do we protect the soil from erosion in the winter during wind events? What will this look like? So we're right now just having an opportunity through the Guest Genes Foundation to explore what regeneration might look like <clears throat> in these water constrained systems, which doesn't always make cover cropping affordable um, nor easy. <laughs> So <clears throat> I've mentioned the, the idea that we are inspiring the producers um, through price premiums or corporate social responsibility dollars. This is the list of practices. For many of you who are technical service providers with the NRCS or RCDs or UC ex or the extension service, these are probably familiar to you. Most of them are funded by the EQUIP program and are modeled in Comet Farm and Comet Planner. Um, so these are the practices that we think about stacking within a carbon farm plan. And if you go to the Carbon Cycle Institute's website, you can see an example of how these carbon farm plans look, where they, how they stack these practices on, um, on one ranch or one farm. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and so 
we started working with Dr. Creek, aggregating <clears throat> um, all of the practices. If we were to actually implement <clears throat> everything that we have on our to-do list at one of the largest ranches that produce wool in the state of California, we looked at the emission scenario for the production of the wool. And then we looked at what we could potentially do to draw carbon into that system, enhance photosynthetic carbon capture. And we actually realized that we could create a net sink, meaning we can offset the production emissions for wool, but simultaneously we could offset the farm's emissions and have more to spare. So it was kind of an exciting thing to think that these land bases have so much <clears throat> potential to not only offset the emissions associated with other parts of the farm or ranch, but really can contribute to other aspects of the supply chain emissions. Um, so that's that math is what I went to the North Face with and started to say, you know, a lot of times businesses are utilizing their dollars from corporate social responsibility and placing them in parts of the world to do conservation work. What about investing your conservation dollars into your own supply chain? So, you know, this idea of putting the values of conservation or the values of biodiversity, the values of soil organic carbon building and increasing water holding capacity, you know, brands talk so much in the textile industry about water. Well, what about adding more organic matter to these soils so they can hold more water? What about looking at actually retaining more water, looking at the soil as a reservoir versus a place where you're just measuring how much irrigation you're leaching out for a cotton um, crop? Think about the hydrology more holistically. So this message is starting to, I would say, seep down into the, um, the boardrooms and you're seeing traction here where people are like, yeah, let's actually invest in our own system. You're seeing this with VF Corp, you're starting to see it with all birds, like in the wool systems and cotton systems. Um, these are all brands that we've worked with and spent a lot of time in workshops with. <laughs> And we're starting to see um, headway in this vision for investing in your own supply chain. Um, when we worked with the Uni of Concerned Scientists, we did the math also on a wool garment. On the far left, you see a wool garment that's produced using the typical global supply chain, using um, grid energy that's you know, not transformed grid energy, not renewable yet. And on the far, um, far right-hand side, the the, the, the grid or the bar that goes down in the negative, that's actually showing a wool garment that if produced in a regional supply chain using renewable energy, meaning we don't move the wool maybe more than 300 miles from where it's grown, and we use renewable energy, plus we work on the aspects of the ranch where we can add compost to the rangeland or you know, layer these other carbon farm practices in, and if we look at the whole emission scenario from soil to skin, and then we actually include the emissions for caring for the garment, the wash cycle, the dry cycle, the whole what we call use phase, you can, you can retain with cold washing and air drying, plus carbon farming, plus renewable energy, plus a local supply chain, you can make a textile that you wear on your skin that's responsible for removing more carbon from the atmosphere than it emits. This just on a theoretical level, because again, it's, it's, a, it's a model, um, is a very strong message for our future. You know, how can we create material culture that is part of a climate solution? Not just material culture that we're trying to offset the emissions for in all these corners of the world that are still left, that are intact, <laughs> but actually conserve the working lands that materialize what we need and build regional economies that add value to product in rural communities. Really important synergy for rural economic development, um, for I would say economic stability overall. <laughs> I would even argue political stability. Um, but anyway, so going to this climate beneficial model, um, this year um, during COVID, we saw a huge issue with uh, textile brands shutting down their uptake of material. So we worked with a really innovative social impact investment group and we actually, as a community, pooled our own wool, brought it together, did the greenhouse gas metrics on it. And these are some of the growers who are part of a 70,000 pound wool pool 
that we're washing the wool ourselves, we're combing it ourselves, and we're preparing it for textile brands. It's ready to go. It has the math. It has implemented and implementing carbon farm plans. And here's some examples of the wool. This is the first wool that was grown and woven and sewn in California since 1892, when we had 12 vertically integrated wool mills. And this is the indigo that I grow. I farm the color blue, and that's the indigo and flower on the left. And this is undyed, very natural wool that will compost. It has no polyacrylic resins, no finishing agents, no treatments, no synthetic chemistry. It's just raw wool and soap and water and hands, people's hands. <laughs> um, and then lastly, um, this is the North Face project, the beanie and the coat that was done. Um, and I'll just leave you with this vision that um, we are aiming to see all of these systems pulled together in a regional context. So this is our vision for the milling systems, the oak woodlands, the fuel, fuel, fire fuel load reduction projects, synergistically working with cropland grazing, synergistically working with the mills that are running off renewable energy. And we're slowly cracking away at this vision, um, but it's just, again, in time with all of these wonderful partners, including Rex, we're approaching this slowly but surely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I will leave it there and I will stop sharing. I'm gonna um, hand it to Randall, who I'm very excited to hear from and I'm grateful for his participation today. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and this will follow very nicely with, uh, uh, with, with what you're talking about, uh, working with growers as part of the uh, solution. Let me, make my screen large here. Okay, so pleasure to be here, Randy Brown. I'm with Winfield United. It's one of the Lando Lakes uh, companies. And we have four basic business units with, within Lando Lakes. Many of you know the dairy foods, the Lando Lakes uh, image of, uh, of the, the butter dairy products. Winfield United, one of the largest crop distribution companies uh, in the United States, Purina Animal, Animal Nutrition. And then the fourth business unit, a new one, which is Truterra, which is focused on sustainable agriculture. We happen to believe at Lando Lakes uh, as an integrated grower owned cooperative, we're part of the solution of being able to take sustainability and drive it not only from the farmer level all the way to the distribution side. So why is sustainability important? If we look at agriculture, it's responsible for 14% of the total global greenhouse gas. And over half of that comes from nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more detrimental to the environment than carbon dioxide. We think with our data and research capabilities, we have a, a way to impact that, that we can significantly uh, reduce nitrous oxide emissions, uh, as well as uh, we have a big initiative in uh, sequestering and, and storing carbon. We also have an opportunity uh, through conservation programs uh, to limit the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, other nutrients that are uh, coming down rivers, getting in the Gulf of um, Mexico. Um, one of the things that we have to balance with that though is the need for, to feed uh, 9 billion uh, people and stabilize the uh, climate, protect drinking water and ensure water quality. Uh, at this point, we have to increase production, increase efficiency uh, of, uh, of our inputs, reduce fertilizer loss, and be more efficient with all of our operations. We can accomplish that, I think, through great programs using science as a part of this. The other thing that is happening in, in the uh, world is uh, consumers are changing. What they're wanting out of products uh, is a more sustainable, more uh, eco ecological, um, sustainable system. And, you know, as a, a cooperative of trying to make sure that we are uh, meeting those needs of uh, a, a sustainable food source, it's our opportunity to work with growers to accomplish that. We have a soil health strategy of reducing the greenhouse gases, CO2, nitrous oxide, improving the soil health. Anytime we improve soil health on a, on a field, we actually increase its productivity. As Rebecca was saying, we increase water storage, uh, we, we improve the nutrient cycling uh, through that, and we gain efficiency throughout the whole system. So the harder that we try and make uh, our system sustainable, the more 
productive we become, as long as we're advancing yields and not dramatically increasing cost or maybe even reducing cost by more efficient use, this is great for the farmer's ROI. Uh, we can also have a significant impact on, on the waters of the United uh, States. So we're kind of marrying two of our business units uh, here primarily to start, we will move in the, the Purina and also the dairy food uh, more as, as we go forward. But within Winfield United, we have uh, actually a group of agronomists and research capabilities where we're looking at how do we improve our system? How do we improve efficiency? Uh, how do we improve our ROI? But at the same time, making sure we're doing it in an ecosystem responsible uh, matter. Truterra, which is focused solely on uh, the sustainable piece, uh, is really the driver in this. And so it's really driving on monitoring, measuring uh, the inputs, calculating greenhouse gas emissions, also modeling out what happens to soil carbon when we change systems. So it's really marrying the science with uh, our capabilities of delivering uh, out in the field to our growers to make better decisions. We are the only farmer owned and farmer driven uh, sustainable program in the United States. We have a piece in, agri in, uh, in uh, production agriculture that we are focused really on, uh, can we help that grower find markets for increased price uh, on sustainable products, but also we are now in the process of collecting and, and monitoring and selling over 400 million metric tons of carbon credits uh, through a program with several uh, major players. It's really fueled by our insights engine. It's a, it's a software program that closely monitors and measures uh, what growers are doing and what their footprint on that uh, area uh, is. And it's, it's helping consumer goods companies reduce emissions and their supply chain. I'll, I'll show you uh, some of our partners here in a little bit, but we have developed a lot of partners where we're looking at how do we develop this market so that there is an economic uh, benefit for growers to produce uh, crops uh, more sustainable. Uh, we are also developing carbon credits for those seeking to offset their greenhouse gas footprints. A lot of the ag business that we work with that we supply fertilizer, ag chemicals, whatnot, are looking to partner with growers to, uh, to develop a program to offset some of their greenhouse gas footprints. Uh, we're improving the supply shed sustainability, uh, developing improvements in soil, nutrient utilization, water use, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, also looking at differentiating commodities based on sustainability claims. We have several entities that are looking at, can we offer low carbon grain uh, products out there? Can we back up those claims? And also claims around water quality and uh, quantity. Um, it's, a, it's totally a flexible farmer and retail centered, uh, retail, retailer centered uh, approach. So we talked about the uh, true carbon uh, system. Uh, we're really looking at how can we manage these fields better so that we can sequester carbon uh, and by putting farmers and retailers at the center of this. It's pragmatic, it's farmer focused, it's yield focused. It's, it's really about trying to drive the value chain from the farmer to retailers to the consumer good companies. Um, we support that through education and awareness. Uh, we, we are also in the business of aggregating growers uh, data. We don't own the data, but we aggregate it for growers so we can put that on up the supply chain and can be used uh, to develop programs. Um, we have conservation agronomy experts and we develop, we're in the development of both emissions reduction and carbon uh, offset carbon credits in that market. The Land of Lakes Network actually touches about 50% of the harvested acres in the United States, 25% of all row crop farmers, 30% of all animal uh, protein, and 90% of the grocery store shelves. We're on 90% of the, the shelves out there with our dairy products. So we think we have a responsibility. We also have an opportunity to really focus in and, and help growers uh, make this transition uh, to a more sustainable 
product. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but here's some of the partners that we have that are participating uh, in this initiative with us. And we're developing a, I think a very good system of both research data and opportunities for, for growers to participate. Now I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we really think it's a, a, a partnership with a lot of uh, different branches on it. Part of that is nutrient uh, management. We're trying to pro provide some cutting edge tools that allow growers to make better decisions. Most growers out there want to do the right thing. They, they want to be responsible. They want to participate in this, but in a lot of times we just don't have the science. We don't have the knowledge. So we're trying to be that link to growers of uh, disseminating that, that information to them so that they can make the best decision possible for their environment. This is just a screenshot of the uh, Futera Insights, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of, uh, of what we're, we're measuring. It really is an all-inclusive uh, program where growers input their data into it, and then they are scored based on their sustainability. Uh, it looks at things, it's based on soil erosion, it's based on nutrient loss, uh, based on conservation uh, adoption, but you can also see we're really focused on nitrogen use efficiency. Again, thinking about how do we manage that nitrous oxide out there. Most of the nitrous oxide that is emitted into the atmosphere is nitrogen that's left over after our cropping systems is in the soil. If we can reduce that to below 40 pounds uh, per acre at the end of a corn crop, some other crop, we can significantly reduce the amount of nitrous oxide that is emitted when we aren't growing that crop. Uh, obviously some things around wind erosion, but also greenhouse gas uh, emission, okay? We think this is an industry leading uh, precision ag uh, platform that uh, can help give information to, to growers. It actually looks at a field geospatially. We can look at problem areas of the field. We can identify areas where we're having some issues with erosion or wind or water uh, loss. Maybe we have nutrient loading into a, a, a stream and we can make some recommendations from a conservation standpoint on what to do with that. Some of those areas that are typically small areas of the field uh, that are contributing most to the environmental problem tend to be our less productive acres anyway. So those are the acres that we may look at taking out of production, doing something else, put a buffer crop in there, uh, grass waterway, whatever. And it's really focusing on an ROI of that field of making decisions. Uh, what's it gonna do to my profitability by making some of these uh, changes out there? Here's another um, couple screenshots off the tool looking at uh, soil quality trend and are we going in the right direction? So are we improving uh, soil? Are we going backwards? Do we have erosion? Do we have loss of carbon out there? But then also it focuses on greenhouse gas uh, emission. And you can run some simulations. So it would say, okay, what if I cut my nitrogen rate back? What would that do to my greenhouse gas? Or uh, if we're irrigating uh, natural gas or diesel fuel running our, our irrigation wells, what would happen to our carbon footprint if we didn't water one more time? It also looks at things like uh, what would happen if we put a cover crop, a catch crop in there to take that nitrogen out, or we convert it to no-till. Not only does it give some environmental indicators, but it also estimate a return on investment on some of those. We also have several insights that we can pull from in the field. We have our own uh, soils lab. We do soil health testing. Uh, we can do high resolution soil carbon maps. That's really important as we start to look at uh, this carbon market. Every soil has a different rate at what they build carbon. So we can really focus on the areas that uh, we can have the, the most uh, results and we can get re real time results. We also have an extensive research platform within Winfield United. We call it our answer plot uh, system. And we are about 150 uh, locations out there where we do research, education, training, demonstration, we dig soil pits. This is really a great way for us to be able to touch our grower members and be able to share some of our uh, research, some of our, our knowledge out there and help in this uh, transition. A lot of times you'll visit with 
uh, folks and they talk about, you know, making some changes, sustain a build, and they talk about a yield penalty during the implementation phase. We think through good agronomics and good information, we can eliminate or mitigate the, the amount of uh, impact financially as we make these changes in, in stewardship. One of the things that we're based on as far as a management, we are a seed company also, and we sell our own brand. We also have uh, partners such as DeKalb, Mycogen, NK, Pioneer, and each hybrid re we rate for their response to things like population, response to nitrogen. We know that different hybrids have a different nitrogen uh, response. So we can dial in that nitrogen, still optimize yield, but do it in a more environmentally friendly uh, way. It's really about trying to look at the system holistically, optimize our product productivity out there, uh, but yet limiting our inputs per bush bushel, which is good from the uh, aspect of a grower from an ROI, but also great for the environment. So with that, I think I'm just about out of time and we'll probably open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, Really interesting presentations from both of you. Thank you very much. And we do have a bunch of questions. Um, one specific to Rebecca, though, um, what spinning count is most in demand on uh, in on wool in this fiber shed vision? We've seen um, a demand for very fine gauge yarns um, from the larger brands and then from the marketplace that's focused on hand work, people who are still, you know, beautifully, there's a huge market for actual uh, hand knitting. That's a much thicker gauge. Um, to be specific, a 224 <laughs> <laughs> and a 212 are our um, primary finer gauges for flatbed and three-dimensional knitting um, and wovens. And then on the hand knit side, um, there's a whole gamut of thicker, you know, more artistic yarns that small family owned wool mills across the country are producing and from Wyoming to Winters, California. Wow. So depends Thank on you. who you're serving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good answer. Um, I do have a question. Randy, you had mentioned uh, carbon credits. I'm wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, where do you sell them or who buys them? Is it true carbon or, or like, and what are you getting? And uh, like a follow-up, to that would for both of you would be um, what are the best incentives to kind of incentivize farmers to change their practices? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And right now we are this is a pilot program for us. You know, this market of selling carbon credits is relatively uh, new in the United States. We actually have a, a couple folks that are uh, buying the credits uh, from us. One is uh, Microsoft. We just signed a, a deal with them uh, to uh, to participate in this. We're we're actually marketing them through the organization of uh, Nori. We are simply an aggregator of these uh, credits and being right. farmer owned cooperative, we feel that's our job is to be able to serve as that link between the market and, and the grower. So we're just, uh, uh, True Terra is actually the, the pass through company for Land O'Lakes where we can, uh, we can measure, monitor, and then assimilate all these credits and then pass them on to, uh, onto the market. As far as incentives, I think right now, this is uh, in the very infancy. There's a lot of carbon credits getting sold out there at $20 a, a metric ton. That's kind of where we're starting the market. We fully realize that uh, this market is, is potentially going to change drastically in the next six to, to 12 months. I don't think we really know where these carbon credits are. One of the things I do want to stress, so I think this is a real market. There's going to be some incentives, whether they be uh, payments or uh, some subsidies out there on the greenhouse gas and the soil carbon. But the other thing that I try and uh, educate growers on, the real benefit of building soil carbon is really looking at soil health and we can yeah. gain tremendous amount of yield stability and yield potential by <laughs> developing these soils. So we don't want to forget that it's the right thing to do uh, from a production and an agriculture standpoint point, we also have the ability to capture some value for growers on these other other markets there. And Rebecca, I'll let you uh, comment if you have any comment on that. 
Oh, thank you, Randall. Yeah, so I, I think that, um, well, can we go back to the original question just for a quick review, Rex? <laughs> sure. Well, the carbon credits, you know, I, I, um, I'm personally a little bit skeptical about carbon credits because I don't think the price of carbon is enough of an incentive for farmers to change see, their yeah. behaviors. But okay. like, do you use them and or what incentives uh, are available to change farmers' behavior? I would say that carbon credits, just just to be you know clear about, also the I think the second or third slide I issued that we have to do two things at once. We actually have to neutralize our industrial systems that are mechanical, and we have to create net sinks. So selling credits into the mechanical system makes sense as long as you're capping your emissions every year and you're really bringing those emissions down. So I just wanted to frame the meta level reality of how we stabilize the climate <laughs> right how credits fit into that they have to you know we have to we have to cap the the other part of the the economy and keep supporting that economy to use um, forms of non co2 e emitting gases so it, it could be a, a, these credits could be potentially just at that meta level a succession for us or a trajectory towards the, the economy that we are going to ultimately need that creates um, functioning agroecological systems on our farmland and a renewable energy powered economy. Um, do credits prices cover the cost of these practices? No. Um, even at 20 a ton, which Randall, I'm so glad you're going at 20. I'm like 20 plus. That's high. Yeah, that's <laughs> high. <laughs> We need, we need so much more per ton to, to, to be the, if it were the sole amount of money required to implement a practice, I think you would need to see the price of carbon be exceptionally higher even than what we're seeing on the market today. And it was really around 12 or 15 a ton for some time because we were competing with global markets. We're starting to see at least a domestic market um, you know, stabilize at slightly higher prices, but the incentives for change that I've observed um, are interesting. They're slightly deeper in motivation for some of the producers I work with. It's about seeing their product serve the community in ways that are visceral and real to them in places where they, so in wool, they never saw the wool come back. They never saw it on human skin. They didn't see the effort of, they didn't see their labor manifest. So, and maybe this is different with Land Lakes because it's a co-op and it's already organized to see product on 90% of the shelves at the grocery store. So, but I think in our system, the incentive was we're gonna give you a premium and we're gonna make sure to keep that wool on our domestic shores. And, um, and that was huge. Um, so that piece, but also, aggregating public dollars where appropriate. So making sure that it, I see how to make change as a pie chart. It could be a, you know, a sliver maybe of a carbon credit, a quip grant for California, it would be a healthy soils grant. Um, we have a small carbon farm seed fund that we've started. I think it's all of those things. And so what I see the need for the change is that we have people helping growers aggregate and pool and get the funds and implement. I think the role of technical assistance is huge right now as we make transitions. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And I think, uh, again, if you look at it holistically and that's, I, I went through it fairly fast, the partners we have are absolutely critical in helping to fund and educate and, uh, and to drive this system. Okay. And, you know, we only have about a minute left, but um, I would ask each of you to just briefly <clears throat> talk about the role of consumers in all of this. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go first really uh, quickly. Um, the consumers are the driver. So con consumers are changing. They're asking for this. And there's an economic opportunity for people to participate at a different level because of that. Um, Rebecca? I would agree. Um, the consumer signals um, for us, they show up in very complex market analysis reports. I don't think, you know, consumers may want 
may, may not want to recognize how tracked their purchases are. <laughs> but when we do analytics on the trajectory of certain markets and we go to purchase these dynamic reports, everyone who's investing in certain aspects of the market, whether it's biodegradable um, homegrown textile that is associated with carbon farming or a Land of Lakes product that has a regenerative ag component, um, that's all tracked and it really helps the feedback loop. It's really a feedback loop. It's a call and response. Consumers call out, producers respond, and we can change systems through that. Of course, not to negate the role of your citizenship and your voting and your engagement with your society on those public um, citizenry levels, but I would like to say that those are both extremely important in this movement. Right. And, and citizenry. Good. And uh, hopefully consumers are willing to pay a little bit more uh, just for the benefit that they're receiving from healthier soils, cleaner water, cleaner air, that kind of thing. And, you know, we're a little bit past the closing time of the session. So Rebecca and Randy, thank you so much for uh, honoring us with your presentations and your knowledge. It's been very, very interesting. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Rex. Thank you. Thank you.